the gifts, the God who delivered them, the God who continued to look over them. And so, so, so we are so easy as people to forget um, the good things that God um, does for us. And we are so quick to stray from him, even as he continues to look out for us. We are, we are often ungrateful. And history shows this. Um, God's people throughout history have tended to stray from him. And it doesn't matter whether they have um, things or they don't have things. That, as a matter of fact, sometimes the more we have, the more we tend to want to dismiss God from our lives and focus on those things and become materialistic and idolize, idolize um, the gifts. And so we ought to be careful, you know, to, to, to worship God and not the gifts that he gives to us. All right. Um, do we have any um, remarks, any comments? Anything anybody would like to add? All right. If we don't have anything to add, we just move now to chapter 10. So in chapter 9, the people have spent some time reflecting and we know that it's important for us as people to introspect. We need to look into ourselves and to see, you know, ourselves truly for who we really are, you know, the good and the bad, especially the bad, because we need to work on the, on the negative things about us so that God can help us. Um, the psalmist says, search me, O God. You know, we ought to search ourselves and ask God to highlight for us those things that are not of him, those things which are not pleasing to him so that we can make amends. And so the people introspected in chapter nine and after introspection, they made a commitment. As a matter of fact, they recommitted themselves and they made an agreement. And this agreement really is... Um, something that they had agreed to, you know, from the, from the time of Moses. And so it's, they're going back now um, after looking at how they have behaved, after looking at how they have strayed from God, they're now um, determined to, to recommit themselves um, to God, to go back to that covenant that God made with his people from the time of Moses. And so the, the, the list of um, the agreement is summarized here before us. And it's a summary of verse 30 to verse 39. So there are really six um, agreement, covenant promises that the people have decided to follow. The first, not to marry non-Jewish neighbors. And this was so because what would have what what happened over time was that as they intermingled and they intermarried, they allowed um, these people who were of a different religious belief and practice from them to influence them. So they were now being influenced by um, their non-believing um, neighbors. And so the covenant now was not to marry um, non-Jewish neighbors because as they, when they did so, they strayed from the rule and the laws of God. The second covenant promise um, to observe the Sabbath. And uh, as they observed the Sabbath, they would not um, work and so on. And this was so because um, this was God's way of letting them focus on rest, focus on him, rather than focus on monetary gains. So they were to observe the Sabbath. The third, they were to observe every seventh year as a Sabbath year. Fourth, um, they were to pay a temple tax. Um, number five, they were to supply wood for burnt offerings in the temple. And six, they were to give dues to the temple. So they were now recommitting um, themselves, their relationship with God, um, their religious practices and traditions um, that they had 
you know, failed to carry out because they were influenced by um, non-believers among them. And so they, the time, it was a time for them now to recommit themselves to Almighty God. Right, so it's important that as we rebuild our lives, um, we not just make empty promises, but we commit to what we, you know, promise God that we ought to do, and we carry it out, no matter how difficult it is. We carry out our promises to God, and God will help us, and God will be there with us as we seek to obey Him, and as we obey Him, we'll find that we'll we'll have a wonderful relationship with God. And sometimes we feel that when we obey God, we are making, you know, we're going to be putting ourselves um, in a place we're not going to be enjoying ourselves and so on. But, you know, we experience as we build a relationship with God. The Bible says a peace that passes all understanding, joy that is unspeakable, and not a joy that comes from temporary, you know, pleasures and gains from the world but a joy that comes from his Holy Spirit. And so it was, it's important for us, um, even as it was important for the Jews to recommit themselves to, to God. And so even us as Christians, we ought to every day, you know, examine ourselves just as they did, they introspected. We should examine ourselves. And as we examine ourselves, we, we repent of, our sins and we ask God to help us and we make the commitment that to the best of our ability, the Lord being our help, we will do what God asks us to do. All right. We're going to move now to chapter. Reverend Levy. Yes, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Before you move to the next chapter, yes, Sister Rose. Would Mark. you expand a little on um bullet number three observe every seventh year as a sorry as a sabbath year <clears throat> okay in the in leviticus it talks about um having not just a sabbath day but a sabbath year as well and so for the time when we experience when or when we observe the Sabbath year. Um, it's a time when we, when our debts are forgiven. So for instance, like the Jewish, the, the more wealthy Jews that we, we encountered earlier in Nehemiah, who gave loan, loans to the poorer Jews and who used their lands, you know, to stand as, you know, guarantee. Um, for those loans and most times the poor can't pay back um, their debt um, their debt but what God um, instituted with the Sabbath year was that it would be no a year when um, persons debts would be would be cancelled and they would be they would have the opportunity to start afresh debt free right and that's what the Sabbath year um was about having a fresh opportunity to to restart um their lives is that okay thank you you're welcome and of course we know that um the taxes and so on that they would be asked to pay um, was to be able to help to to run um, the the work of the Lord, so that the work of the Lord could continue um, in the in the temple, um, to look after the Levites and the priests who really should not be working, but the tax would help them so that they would be able to live. And we would encounter further down. I'm not sure who would actually read um, those. Um, Verses where there came a time when the the Levites and the priests had to go to work because the per, the people had started to renege on their promises and their pledges, and they now had to start to, to work for their living. And so the, the Levites 
guys now not actually carrying out the duties that they were supposed to be doing because they now had to start to work um, in order to feed themselves and so on. So the, the tax, the temple tax helped the Levites and the priests to serve in the temple so that they would be able um, to live. Rep, Rep, Reverend Levy, just, just to ask some, um, on a, a question on the third bulletin as Sister Rawson was asking. Yes. Seventh year from when? Because if they if somebody loan me money and it's seven years time, probably he lend somebody you now one year to my seventh year. So is it the seventh year or seventh year from when I buy the money? For argument's sake. Because you say since the rich the richer Jews mm -hmm. were loaning us and guarantee for a particular uh, some people, is not Everybody at one time, I guess, is interim. Like after the first year, might somebody might need it. After the third year, so what? Where do the seventh year start and stop? I'm, I'm not. I'm gonna hazard a guess. I'm just gonna assume that it's not. This, it's not that everybody is gonna get a different start, but there is one set period of time. That's what I believe. Okay, so some somebody might just get one after start one year. The seventh year might be next year. So just one year. Of reprieve? Yes. Perhaps so. Okay, okay. That's all I start now. Yes. Reverend Levy. Yes. Sister Faith. Good. Yes. Good evening, okay. everybody. Good evening. Um the the requirements you you had on your screen just now. Is is there a um some comparison that we can draw with today so what aspects of our covenanting today would would be comparable to that or or you know what aspects are substituted for those because those things we don't do anymore right that, that was under the law and um, i suspect that you you know that we do would do it even though we're not under the law and we don't we're not compelled to a 10 percent and that sort of thing you're talking about well i'm talking about the the points you had on the screen just now okay so like the first one now not to marry non-jewish neighbors right right um, so you had about we, seven points all right so one of the ways in which perhaps we could compare this perhaps this is not saying that you are not going to um mix with persons who are not of our faith but if it is that you find that um, persons who are influencing you to go um, against, you know, your faith, your belief in God, and then so then we ought to check ourselves. We ought to know um, that we, we ought to set some kind of boundaries, um, that sort of thing. Would is this going? where the un, unequally yoked com, comes in? Yes, I think so in some cases because um, when you hear about be, not being equally yoked in marriage and that sort of thing, perhaps it is that um, you may um, be involved or have a romantic relationship that leads to marriage with somebody who is um, against um, not your beliefs and perhaps what they might do might pressure you into, you know, leaving behind your um, faith, your practices, your belief system, um, that sort of thing. You know, persons might, in, might interpret it um, that way. But I don't think it is um, limited to just marriage. I just, think, I just think it is, generally speaking, you would not want to be um, where or in a place where you are now being your faith, you are now being influenced. Um, Paul says it in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And so I think that ought to guide us. So be not conformed um, to this world, mm -hmm. right? So we don't allow the, the values of the world. And that's what started to happen with the Jews as they marry into um, non-Jewish families. They know 
began to conform. And that's how they that's how they break up, they started to break away now from their relationship with God. It's it mm. starts with, with that. And at one point, as we would go further down in the chapter in, in, in Nehemiah, where Nehemiah used the example of King Solomon to say that here was a very powerful um, king and a, a great king. And what caused, what was one of the main things that caused his downfall? His involvement um, with persons from, you know, different beliefs that caused him. Uh, and so we ought, um, to, we ought to know our own weaknesses. We ought to know what we can be able to, so just as so we know our strengths, we ought to recognize what our weaknesses are. And maybe some persons will be able to be around, um, you know, other people and it, not, it doesn't influence them. Where there are some persons who, you know, they're easily influenced by, um, you know, peer pressure, you know. So we are to, to be realistic about, you know, our own strengths and our own weaknesses as well. Yeah. I, I think it is also an issue of priorities because your, your friends, certainly your spouse, if they have different priorities, if they love a, a completely different set of things or have a completely different set of values, then you can see how conflict would arise in a relationship. And so, so I mean, I, I agree with you. It, it, it certainly is obvious as it relates to, to uh, a marriage, but it is also true of other relationships yes. where, um, you know, you could, you could depart from your faith or from just, just um, strengthening your walk, improving, enhancing, growing, in, in Christ, if that is your focus and the person you're close to, as a friend, as a husband, as a wife, is, is, has a whole different agenda. That, yeah. that is conflicting. Um, Deacon, um, Reverend Levy, can we ask the person who, who has some background noise there to... to Mute. Okay, somebody's mic is on. Okay, it's off now. Yes. Thank you. All right, any other comment, any other observation? <laughs> yes, I, I have a comment. Yes. My, my, my comment is that, yes, it's nice to go spiritually among your believers and your friends, but the problem no i shouldn't say a problem how are we as believers going to win soul if we are only amongst ourselves right. that is my because you see i believe that if we need to win people to the kingdom we need to go to our comfort zone right. so, i don't think that's what the what we're saying that they are not supposed to be, you, you don't mix with other persons and you don't talk to other persons and so on. It's just about um, not allowing yourself to be influenced instead of being the influencer. You understand? Um, because sometimes um, we, we might go about um, how we do things in such a way that instead of actually um, winning people, um, influencing other persons for Christ. Um, if we're not careful, we may start now to be drawn to what they, their values and their, their attitudes are. And that's, I think that's a caution um, from, this, from this passage, to be careful not to allow um, the value system of the world to influence us as God's people. Because yes, we are in the world, the Bible tells us, but we are we are not of the world. And so we, we can't, we're not going to live in a bubble, you know, but how do we make sure that we 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 keep 
to our um, belief system with and not compromise even as we um, relate with other persons. So we have to be strong in the world. We have to keep, you know, we have, there are certain things that we, have, we ought to do. We ought to have our, you know, our prayer life ought to be priority. We ought to know the word of God and know what God wants of us so that when we see um, or we are, we are bombarded with certain influences and, you know, it's not just about you talking, you know, rapping with people. Um, the influence comes as we watch um, television, as we watch advertisements, as we watch the different shows and, and movies and so on. Um, just a simple advertisement might be, you know, contrary to, to God's um, word and God's will and purpose for us. But if we're not careful, if we don't understand what God wants for us, then we now become influenced by, by that. So it's not just about not talking to this person because that person is not a Christian. No, it is about not allowing the influence, the value system of the world that is contradictory to God's kingdom values to influence us. Yes, good evening. Good evening, Sister Sophia. Yes, I wanted to add earlier about um, intermarine being practiced now. It's, it does with the Jews here in Jamaica, like the Issas and so on, because there's a case with a family member who married someone of another race and he was excommunicated from the family. So in fact, it's still happening among, among the, the Jews and in Jamaica. We have the Machalans, the Issas and so on. Okay. So let's still maintain that, that law, if you may call it that. Okay. But but for us as Christians, it's not just that way. It's we're not forbidden to marry persons of a different, you know, belief or faith. But if, if you believe that it's oh, you feel comfortable, you know, um, if you feel that your faith can hold up on the you know, different influences and so on, that's, that's okay um, if you think you can manage that and if you feel that the friends that you keep, um, if it is that you can be an influence to them instead of them influencing you, well, you each person to their own conviction. But I believe that generally speaking, um, what it really is cautioning us against is not allowing ourselves um, to conform to um, standards other than God's standards. All right, Brother Carl. Yes, we are. That's okay. Yeah, my own call Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, and we're going to move now to chapter eleven, and. With chapter 11, really, it's just about um, Nehemiah, you know, trying to repopulate the city because the city of Jerusalem would have been sparsely um, populated. And most of the persons who were living in um, the area were living on the outskirts um, of outskirts of the of the city and so in order to you know rebuild the city um Nehemiah you know in order to allow Jerusalem now to become the hub you know of this newly renewed nation he needed the city to be repopulated um when we look at the when we look at the um this, that particular chapter there seems to be, you know, some resistance by some persons to, to want to move. And there are several, you know, there are different reasons for this because the truth is some persons would have made their, built their homes and so on and making their living on the outskirts and they would now have to uproot and to rebuild. And so that would be difficult. That would be a difficult ask for some of them. And so some volunteered you know, to do so, 
and Nehemiah also drew lots. Um, so it's one in 10 of the population would be um, brought back into the city to repopulate the city. All right, so chapter 11 really is about um, just repopulated of the city and establishing, you know, different policies um, in that way. All right, so we can move to chapter 12. All right, so we look at some key verses um, in chapter 12. I'm going to read for us chapter 12, verse 27 to 31. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. The singers also were brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Netophilites from Beth Gilgal and from the area of Geba and Azmapheth. For the singers had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. When the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates and the wall. I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right toward the dung gate. All right, we'll pause um, at, chapter, at page 30, at verse 31. So we see where the dedication of the wall was a celebratory event. And this was a big thing, you know, it was a it was grand occasion um, dedicating the wall. Um, and this was characterized by singing. This was characterized by praising. And there was a lot of joy, you know, around dedicating the wall. And we know why that would have been so, because, you know, um, when the wall was broken down, the people felt rejected. Um, the, the people did not have a sense of being their own, but now they were a nation again. And there was, a renew, there was a renewal about them. And so here they were now dedicating the wall um, to God, praising God, thanking God for his goodness, you know, confessing their sins to him and just, and just overall worshiping, worshiping God. And so here in chapter 12, it's about the wall had now been completed. It's about now dedicating the wall. And so what we do now when we build, you know, our temp or church um, buildings and so on, and we dedicate it, this is something that has been done um, from, the, from the beginning, where when we, when we do something in God's honor and for God's glory, um, we have a wonderful service of dedication where we are celebrating um, God's goodness um, to his people. And so chapter 12 is about um, is about that dedication, renewal, um, celebrating what God has done for his people. So the wall was now finally um, completed and now they're now rebuilding their relationship with God, right? And we're on to our final chapter, chapter 13. And I just want to highlight for us verse 23 to verse 31. Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat them. I beat some of the men and pulled their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage to your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God 
and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we here know that you are too, you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Jordan, son of Elisha, the king of the high priest, was son-in-law to Sandala to the Horonite, and I drove him away from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood of the Levites and of the Levites. So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties, each to his own task. I also made provision for contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits. Remember me with favor, oh my God. Nehemiah seems a bit harsh here um, in, in terms of his reaction. Anybody want to comment on Nehemiah's reaction to what um, was taking place? Why do you think he was so, you know, angry and responded like this? I think because um, they were breaking a sacred covenant that they made with God not to um, marry foreigners. Mm -hmm. um, that was essentially the issue. Mm -hmm. His view was that um, breaking the covenant of God, with God was a sea was serious and deserve um, strong, strong action. And it seemed to be that such a short time after uh, making you know this turn, you know they seem now to be so quick to go back to, um, you know what they were doing prior to. Um, perhaps when you may look at all the work um, that was done, you know, and how God would have helped them, you know, to do. And it's not just the marriage, but, the, but what the marriage caused, what caused them to do. Because one of the things that happened was that he, because of, because of it, I think one of the, those persons who were not Jews were now living in the got a room for themselves in the um in the temple because of of, of this and we read where the, when it says that um some of the people because they intermarried the children did not know the language of judah i believe it's not just um the the language itself the words but i believe it meant more than just the language i think the practices and the traditions um instead of knowing the traditions the Jewish traditions, they were now being taught more the traditions of the other religion that they had um, in their midst. So even though it says the language, um, it perhaps would be more than just not being able to talk um, the Jewish language, but the actions, the, the faith, the, the, the practices, um, they were not being passed down to them. So the, there's a new generation now that was coming up who would not know anything about both God and the Jewish belief. And perhaps that was why, you know, he would have been so irate um, to, to act out in the way that he did um, when he saw all of this, because he saw them now reverting, going back to where they were coming from, um, backsliding as it were, um, and then starting having perhaps to go to go through the punishment and to go through God um, punishing them and them, you know, having to live with the consequences of being um, distant from God and so on. So Nehemiah now was so, you know, upset. Um, the Bible, you know, one of the things that um, we can look at, you know, and examine the Bible um, for is just to learn from the people who are in the Bible as well, because God's people were not perfect. And we can look at their lives and see, you know, some of what they did that, you know, led them astray. 
from God that broke their relationship, severed their relationship with God. And we can learn from their mistakes. Um, um, as I pointed out, and as we read, where Nehemiah used the example of Solomon's mistake to teach the people. And, you know, he was one of the greatest kings, and yet the influence of unbelievers contributed to his fall. All right, so we summarize now what we would have learned, you know, having looked at the book of Nehemiah. There are so many takeaways from the very beginning to the end, you know, so many reminders too um, of what is important as we, we try to live um, our lives for God. Um, one of the things that we can take from Nehemiah is to have a consistent prayer life. And we need to continue to build our relationship with God. And prayer is one of those resources that God gives to us that causes us to draw near to him. And so we build our relationship through prayer with God. Okay, we read God's word. Um, the Bible tells us to hide God's word in our hearts so that we might not sin against him. When we read God's word and we know his word, we know what he expects of us and what we ought not to do. Um, from Nehemiah, we learn how important it is to have a plan, to have a clear purpose. And as we have that clear purpose, we work towards um, that purpose. Um, Nehemiah started out with a plan and he kept to that plan. He stuck to that plan. And so that help, helps us to know that it's important to be committed. And because of, you know, keeping um, and working towards that plan, he was able to successfully carry out his mission, which was to complete um, the walls, to rebuild the walls and to repair the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down. Um, from Nehemiah, we learned that we, we serve God um, with everything that we are. We serve him with our time. We serve him with the gifts that we have, our talents, and we serve him with our um, monetary resources. So we serve God with, you know, being available to him. We serve him by using our gifts um, to build his kingdom and to glorify his name and to use the monetary gifts that he has given to us um, in order to help to do so. We learn also from Nehemiah how important it is you know, to have an upright character. And, you know, no matter what they were accusing Nehemiah of, um, they told lies on him and so on, um, Nehemiah's character stood, you know, the test of, of these accusations. It's important for us as Christians to have an upright character. And finally, um, look out for the interests of others. Nehemiah, at the beginning of the story, was living a great life. Um, he was comfortable because he was, you know, he had an important role, you know, as cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And that was a very influential role. And, you know, he was quite comfortable and, you know, could have continued to live comfortably. Um, however, he kept inquiring about um, the exiles who had returned to Judah. And when his fellow countrymen reported that, you know, the place is in shambles and the people are just distraught and dismayed, Nehemiah could not, you know, continue um, to give a blind, he could not give a blind eye to what his, his people were experiencing. Um, you know, they were in embarrassment and their spiritual lives were in shambles and so on. But um, he, he, looked, he looked out for them. And he, he, he made sacrifices in his own life so he could look out for them. And finally, we learn that God is a forgiving God. And he gives us opportunities after opportunities after opportunities to start afresh. You know, whether it's spiritually, you know, whether it's personally, whether it's relationship-wise, whether it's professionally. He always gives us um, opportunities for a fresh start. So sometimes through our own fault, sometimes not through our own fault, we may fall. Sometimes we make mistakes, etc. But once we are we are alive, God presents us with new opportunities to make amends with relationships, 
to get a fresh start. Sometimes our lives might get destroyed. We might make bad financial decisions. We might lose our homes through natural or man-made disasters, but we can rebuild because God gives us, God gives us a strength to work to achieve our goals. The Bible tells us that he is a restorer. He restored the people's worth and their pride. And he said in the book of Joel that I will restore the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. And so we can restart. No matter how far we have strayed, no matter how battered we have been by life's storms, by life's experiences, we can rebuild, we can reboot because with God, all things are possible. But as we live our lives, let us ensure that our priorities, somebody mentioned about priorities earlier, ensure that our priorities are ordered correctly. You know, God must be first in our lives. And we are to constantly examine ourselves in the light of God's word. Continue to read his word, continue to pray, pray for forgiveness, live according to his will, in God, involve God in everything that we do, in all our decisions and so on. And in everything, the Bible tells us to give God thanks, celebrate his goodness towards us, because no matter what is happening towards us, as we always say, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And so we are to celebrate his goodness and to share his goodness with those around us. And so the book of Nehemiah, you know, has been for me and I'm sure for many of us here who continue to join from, you know, week after week, a, a reminder, you know, of who God is um, to us and how we ought to be um, toward him and towards each other and just to refresh us and to remind us of you know his love his compassion and that once there is life you know we have a, an opportunity for a fresh start to rebuild to restore and to reboot thank you All right thank you so much everyone for you know having been a part of this study on Nehemiah for the past few weeks. And I trust that, you know, as we leave from here, we continue to reflect upon the different um, lessons um, that we would have picked up um, through Nehemiah's experience, through his life and the experience of, of the Jewish people um, at that time, right? As we close, do we have any, um, any comments, any? reactions, any, you know, thing that would have come out at you, jumped out at you, you know, that you'd want to mention before we close, before we hand over to Deacon McIntyre. Any takeaways that you would like to share with each other? Is yes, um, if I may, I, um, I, as, as I continued with my reading, I, I, I was looking at this commentary and in line with everything you just said in, in, in summarizing the, the, I, I, I thought I would just share this with you because it's consistent with what you said and it sort of points us to, to see who the ultimate source of our ability to keep covenants is it is jesus so um it says nehemiah did his best to make the people of god strong to make them safe and secure beyond that he also led them to be pure worshipful and obedient yet he carried a sense of failure in nehemiah chapter 10 the people made a solemn covenant to god that they would not do certain things such as have ungodly romantic relationships, buy and sell on the Sabbath, or fail to support the work of God financially as he commanded. Nevertheless, only 10 years later, Israel was again steeped in the exact sins they vowed to stop. So Nehemiah had to address these issues again. 
despite their promises. And the it, it makes a point that rules and vows and promises and covenants are powerless to stop sin. Yes. Only the grace of God alive and flowing in our lives. And you talked earlier about that commitment to, to reading the word of God, to, to growing, can give us the power to truly overcome sin. Yes. Paul expressed this in Romans chapter 8 says for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh god did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh so for us victory rests in looking to jesus oh, yes. and so all of this points us to the fact that if we could be saved by our own promises by our own commitment then we wouldn't have you know, you know the plan of salvation was unnecessary we need Jesus today on the cross, no. Yes, for we are qualified. Yes. We aren't saved by the vow we make or turning over a new leaf, but by trusting in who Jesus is and what he has done to save us. I, I just wanted to, to, to thank you that. so much for sharing that, Sister Faith. Indeed, that summarizes, you know, in a nutshell, Nehemiah's experience and what we continue to do because I mean, as after 10 years and they, they went back, that's how we are too. Today mm -hmm. we say one thing and the next day we go right back, you know, yes. on our promises to God. But one thing we know God always, you know, um, you know, forgives us, but we don't abuse the grace, Paul says, um, yes. that we have been in given. Right. We continue to, to do you know, God helping us, his spirit inside of us um, to do what he wants us to do. And just to live, you know, the way that he wants us to live. Any other final comment just before Deacon Joseph, you know, comes? All right, so thank you so much for sharing, you know, some persons you know, have been here from the very beginning. Some have joined on a little bit later, but all of us have, you know, come on this platform and shared together. And we are, and I believe that we are all, you know, stronger for, you know, sharing and helping, you know, iron sharpness, iron the word says. So let us continue to, you know, keep faithful to the word of God um, that guides us, um, that's a lamp onto our feet, a light onto our path because it's God's word, you know, that will help us along the way. All right. Thank you so much again, everybody, for sharing tonight. All right. Over to you, Deacon McIntyre. We thank God for his word. We thank him for keeping the servant and enabling her to interpret his word to us. We also thank him for receptive hearts and for the clarity that came through the study and for those who enabled the study with their commentaries and responses. We continue to look to God from whence cometh our help. We continue to study his word to show ourselves approved we continue to ask of him to order our steps in his word and in his word. As we seek now to part from this platform, we continue to remember those who are unwell, those who are mourning, those who are at this point questioning. We place before God, Jamaica land we love, and the world at large. We place before him the many families who are hurting in our country, the very sad realities that come to our spaces each morning, each day, each minute. When will it end? We seek now to look to him in prayer. Let us pray. 
listening God. Your ears are ever open to our cries. We call upon you now to hearken to the voice of our supplication. As we make our request known to you, give an ear to our prayer, O oh God. Lord, we place before you our country, our heart, Grief, our hearts, pain, and the many things that are happening in our island home. Sometimes it gets so close to home, Lord, that we we become fearful. Lord, as we contemplate the what next, as we ask the question. As we ponder, as some of us worry, we pray that you, the God of comfort, the God who the answers, God who promises to protect, provide, and to preserve, will watch over our lives, give us grace that we'll make it after all. As we shudder at the things that are happening in our world, and in our country, Jamaica. We ask, Lord, for your intervention. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage for the living of these days. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage for the facing of this all. We commit to you now, Lord, all who are on this platform, the homes from which we come, the families represented, we ask, Lord, for your continued enabling, your continued protection upon our lives. May we be careful to give you the praise, to live lives that exemplifies you. Great God, we commit to you the leadership of our church. Give us ears to hear what you're saying in such a time as this. Give us eyes to see what you're doing among us. Most of all, Lord God, give us a spirit of obedience to respond to you and your promise. We commit to you now, your servant, Sherna Gale. We thank you, Lord, for having spoken through her. Pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will continue to abide in her and with her and her family. We commit to you also our own pastor. That wherever he is, you the God of protection will continue to watch over him and his family. We commit to you now, Lord, our lives afresh. Receive the praises we offer you and the thanks. Continue, Lord, to journey with us as we continue to journey in this world. May your word continue to be a light or a path, O oh God. Hear this, the prayer we offer, because we ask them in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, and the peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Reverend. Reverend. Thanks, Reverend. Thanks, Reverend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings, everybody. We're leaving our church service starts at 9 a.m. on Sunday. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Hi, Verna. Hi, Hi. Come, Kathleen. Hello. Hmm. How are you doing? Not bad. <laughs> I'm actually in the car. <laughs> <coughs> I'm right. on my back on my bed. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> oh, my dear. <laughs> but I'm home. I'm home, so that's good. Oh. Nice, everyone. Okay. All right. Recovery, Sister Rawson. Thanks.
I am doing everything I can. Okay. All right, good. <laughs>